Welcome to OneClimate.net's coverage of the UN Climate Talks. We are here in Durban, South Africa, and Adam, so far, the big story of the two days we've been here has been the rain. Uh, well, yeah, we were warned uh, that we should expect rain here in Durban, but uh, weren't expecting anything quite like what we saw last night. A uh, torrential storm here, which uh, we've actually subsequently learned this morning, uh, killed eight people last night, a, a really dramatic event. Yeah, uh, what happened, uh, it turns out, is that in some of the informal settlements, the townships here uh, in Durban, uh, there was flooding and several houses collapsed and, and eight people were killed. Uh, there's uh, a lot of damage and there was even damage here to the to the UN conference center. Uh, so it's, um, it's, it's quite an auspicious way uh, to start these, these talks and there's been a lot of talk recently about the links between weather events like this and climate change. Mm -hmm. So as Christiana Figueres said uh, today, um, talking to the press, this is you know, a great illustration of the kinds of challenges that we can expect to face if we let greenhouse gases uh, continue to rise um, unchecked. It's, uh, uh, it's a, a, an awful um, tragedy. I mean, you, you, you face this kind of situation in rich countries and it's hard enough, but you face it in countries where people just don't have the resources to, to respond to a flash flood, then the, the consequences are, are horrendously damaging. And uh, this is this is uh, kind of fits in with all of the trends that um, that scientists say that we can see. We had a, a new report recently which uh, shows that climate change is increasing the frequency of extreme weather events, it's increasing the impacts of extreme weather events and when, you, when it hits home somewhere like this then you, you look at it and you think this is it's not good news for the future. Yeah and it's really interesting uh, how clearly that illustrates the divide between how poor people are able to cope with uh, events like this versus how, how wealthier people in wealthier countries are able to cope with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a, a theme that probably is going to come up here in the, in the talks over the next two weeks. Um, so from outside the conference, let's move inside uh, to these uh, really exciting halls here where a lot's taking place. Uh, what are the big issues uh, that we're hearing about today on the first day of the talks. Okay, so we've interviewed uh, quite a few people um, so far and they're all raising uh, the same kind of three or four issues. So maybe the, the big three we shall start off with is the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, this is a big deal because it's the only uh, kind of uh, legally binding global climate law that we have. Um, and uh, campaigners, activists, vulnerable countries, they're desperate to keep this alive. Um, they don't want uh, this, this deal to, to be murdered in Africa and for then um, you know, countries to, to run amok with their emissions. They, they want some kind of framework in existence um, which forces countries to um, reduce and limit their emissions. So that's one of the big, the big issues here, keeping the Kyoto Protocol alive and keeping this, uh, this legally binding framework um, in existence. And there's going to be a lot of talk about the exact details of that, how many years it should be alive for. There's going to be a lot of back and forth. We'll get into the details over the next two weeks. Um, but beyond Kyoto, uh, what else are people looking at? Okay, so we, uh, one of the other things that we need to come out of these talks is a, is a mandate for a, a, a bigger deal, if you like, in the future, one that includes all of the major emitters. Um, we're talking the likes of uh, China, India, Brazil, the US, um, something which you know, really, really covers uh, the majority of the emissions on this planet. So uh, a, basically a commitment to commit. We want, we want a, a clear um, path towards securing this bigger deal in the future. So that's the, the, one of the second big talking points of these talks. Okay, and again, we heard a lot about dates and when these commitments to commit are going to happen, whether it's something we're looking at 2020 or looking at 2015. That, again, will become clear over the next two weeks, and I think that uh, the answers to those questions will say a lot as to whether people say this is a success and we're moving the, the discussions forward or if they chalk this one up to failure. Mm -hmm. uh, the third issue is finance, isn't it? Yeah, so uh, finance is a, is, a, is a big deal here because um, as we saw last night, uh, extreme weather events, uh, the impacts of climate change have devastating consequences around the world, um, especially in poorer countries. You know, these, these countries are just not equipped to cope with, with the, the likes of, of, of uh, you know, flash floods, rising sea levels. And it costs a lot of money to, to adapt to these impacts and it costs a lot of money to reduce emissions. Um, and so last year at the talks in Cancun, um, there was something called the Green Climate Fund which was established um, and the idea of this is that rich countries help poor countries cope with the worst impacts of climate change. So they've got the kind of basis of this agreement um, in place, the, the kind of the concept of the fund is there, um, but what we really need to do now is kind of uh, dash the T's, dot the I's, um, and start putting money in this fund um, and, and start using that money to help people. Okay, and one thing we heard from a bunch of people today is that uh, they, ex they, they hope that the 
the dashing of the T's and dotting of the I's can just happen very quickly, get it, get it over with, because most people seem, most countries seem to be happy with the way that has been developed so far. The big question now is how they're going to fill it up with money, mm -hmm. and that's something that I think is really going to become important over the next two weeks. Uh, beyond that, um, those are the three big issues. Let's talk about the countries. Who are the countries making news today? Oh, well, uh, the, the country that's been uh, uh, at the forefront of um, campaigners' attention today is, is Canada. Um, so there's been rumours um, uh, in the press this morning, um, in the Canadian press, that they're going to uh, withdraw from, from the Coyote Protocol. So withdraw from this, this only um, kind of global climate law that we have. Um, no. And we should just say that um, that their environment minister has said he is neither willing to confirm nor deny that's the case. Yes, yeah, so there's a report on Reuters that came out just a, a few minutes ago. But I think the fact that he's not denying it is also telling. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a worrying development because although several countries have said that they're not prepared to commit to the future of this agreement, if countries start withdrawing already, then you know basically they're saying we made promises in the past, but they mean nothing to us, and it, it sets a worrying precedent. So. Uh, I suspect that Canada is going to come under a lot of a lot of pressure, and um, and this has been this is linked to to, to another big story that's emerged today, which is um, Canada's uh, promotion of, of the tar sands. Um, now, Canada has this this enormous um, kind of potential supply of very very dirty fossil fuels um, that it's looking to develop, um, and the, the problem is is that if it does develop them, it's essentially game over for the climate. It's, it's a, a carbon bomb that's waiting to be set off. Um, so, the story today uh, that came out in the Guardian is that um, Canada is is lobbying the EU and, and lobbying um, influential countries to accept these fossil fuels. Basically, they're trying to dump their shit on everybody else, um, and they're using the UK to to lobby for that. And so, we actually saw um, this evening that the Fossil of the Day Awards, which are a, an award that are um, issued every day at these talks to the to the countries that are causing most trouble at these negotiations, uh, and. Uh, the UK and Canada were, were, were highlighted there as, as you know the, the bad guys today. So one to keep an eye on, and we'll have to see how that develops. They're being uh, they're being um, lambasted, I would say, for blocking progress. Uh, are there any countries out there? Well, we heard a little bit uh, today about some some countries that are that are trying to move things forward and 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 ensure that we do see uh, some progress at the end of two weeks here in Durban. Mm -hmm. So there's a, um, a negotiating block here called AOSIS, which is uh, essentially a block of small island states. These are the countries that are most vulnerable to, to climate change. And um, they're also the countries that, surprisingly enough, are, are most committed to, to sorting this problem out. So they've got some really inspiring examples of, of uh, their own commitments, even though they're, they're very small contributors. They've said, no, you know, this is a big deal for us and we're going to take our own commitments seriously. Um, and, and they came came out all guns blazing in the talks today. Some uh, some great quotes coming out in the plenaries and, and, and in their press releases. They've said they expect ambition levels to step up, um, and that uh, people really need to come to the table. So it's not all doom and gloom. There are there are a few countries here who are looking to forge forward. Yeah, ambition levels I think is an interesting term that we're going to hear a lot about in these two weeks. Uh, basically, what's being said is that the uh, I think what was agreed in Cancun last year was that we need to keep uh, global temperature rises below two degrees Celsius from pre-industrial levels and to do that we need to reduce our emissions by a certain amount. Mm -hmm. Countries have set certain targets of how much they're going to reduce their emissions. So far those targets only amount to about half of what's needed to actually reach that target, their own tar the target that they themselves have set. Mm -hmm. So that's a question of ambition. People are saying it's just not ambitious enough and they need to be more ambitious mm -hmm. uh, if they're actually going to reach their own target, which is what all the scientists say is the minimum that needs to be done mm -hmm. to ensure we don't see destructive, irreversible uh, climate change happening within just a couple of years from now. And then the small island states, they're the only, they're the only countries out there who are linking this, this climate change and, and action. They, you know, the, the vast majority of countries seem to be sleepwalking towards the abyss they they read the science and the science is clear you need to do something now it needs to be immediate and it needs to be it needs to be significant and um, and then they come to these negotiations and we, we kind of continue at a, at a terrifyingly slow pace um, in terms of sorting this out so you do have the, you have these small island states who uh, looks like they've read the science and they've set up and they're, they're doing something so you're an example that we can take from 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 today and and, and throughout these talks of, of a country that's pushing forward.
and there's one other group out there that's actually linking the science and, and ambition and, and action, and, and that's the, the, the Occupy movement, mm -hmm. the, the, the groups that are being very progressive in their actions and trying to call on countries to do more and look at climate justice and what really needs to happen if we're going to reach the targets that scientists say we need to reach. Uh, they held a first rally today mm -hmm. um, where they, they gathered uh, a group of people together to discuss what the issues are. Um, I think that's a movement that's really grown around the world, mm -hmm. connected to economic justice over the past year and I think that'll be another really interesting uh, theme for us to watch here in Durban is to see how that one uh, percent uh, versus 99 percent idea is translated into climate justice and climate action and if that can be used to uh, to really um, push for action on the climate side and not just for economic justice. Mm -hmm. So the, those people who said they were going to occupy the talks, they had their first General Assembly meeting today and I've, I've already read on Twitter they're planning the next one for one o'clock tomorrow so we'll make sure that we follow that for you and, and see how it progresses throughout these two weeks. All right, we'll be bringing you all those stories and more over the next two weeks from Durban here on OneClimate.net.